No, now six. That's six shows now. Sure. Five? Five, Five. or six shows. Okay. You need help doing it? Yeah, for Dude. sure. Well, uh, so we'll it's, handle it. It's going to be me and my wife. We're going to... So what we want to do, we want to do a podcast where we're going to talk about the the couples, you know, couples. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah, husband, wife. But I want to talk about the dynamic stuff, you know, talk about yeah. being in business together. But everyone always hears about all the nice stuff. I want to yeah. talk about the struggles. Amen, buddy. Yeah, that, I, I feel like that's going to be important. That that's a, That is a tough aspect of business ownership when you are working with a spouse. And, and you know, um, a good friend of mine, we've been talking for a while now about having him on and he has we've been back and forth on whether he actually feels comfortable doing that or not Mm -hmm. because it just about resulted in the end of a marriage right yeah and it was a situation where um he was stressed out and things weren't always going like the way he envisioned yeah and so when he went home he wasn't the husband or the father that he should be and little by little it eroded the relationship, right? And he didn't realize that it was doing it, and she didn't realize that it was doing it, but they had kids. Yeah. And so it eroded to the point that it created this massive blow up, right? And I think about that all the time because I've just about done that a couple times, right, and not realized it. Being in business with a significant other is hard yeah. work, dude. Really hard. And I'll... I'm going to tell a I'm going to tell a personal story. She's going to kick my ass if she ever listens to this episode. Um, and I feel terrible about it now. And I, she says she doesn't hold it against me, but I feel like she's still like if we talk about it, it upsets her. Yeah. My wife worked in the shop, and she always said that men treated her differently when it came to like buying service and things like that, and that didn't bother her. But there was this guy who had been a family friend for years and he came in and he was just coming by to like say hello or speak and, and, you know, say hat and sing in years, you know, I've known this guy since I was a little kid and he walked behind the counter and he gave my wife a hug. Now I didn't think anything about it. It didn't cross me as weird. It didn't seem anything like that. But later she said the way that he hugged me and the way that that, interaction felt I felt extremely uncomfortable and without thinking about it I defended him saying no nah, this guy's like a super Christian guy he would never do anything weird he would never anything like that and dude that one stupid little comment that I made yeah. because the way it played out in her head it sounded like I didn't believe her right yeah and so you think about relationships and now we're working together those tiny little things make a huge impact and you don't even realize you've done it. You know? What was she expecting you to do? I, I don't think that it, she did not have expectations for me to do anything because it was already over. Right. Yeah. But that, I'm saying like, uh, I get that, but like she, I'm trying to, I'm trying to like think how would I react to that? And I'd be like, nah, well, so it, it was long story short. What happened with this guy was is shortly after this encounter, he died. And he had something in his brain, uh, like an embolism or something. Mm -hmm. And they suspect, because he started acting like really crazy, Mm -hmm. right around the same time, he went to like all of these, um, like he went out west to uh, some sort of festival, music festival, and he's acting completely different than he had ever acted before. So they suspect something changed in his brain before this happened, right? But I think what she wanted was, is she wanted me to hear her say, that made me feel uncomfortable. She didn't expect an answer from me. She didn't expect me to say something, but she also didn't expect me to defend him. She just wanted me to listen to her, right? Uh, I get that. So what I did was is I made I invalidated the fact that she felt that way. Yeah, you're an ass. I get that part. <laughs> I I don't just don't know that I would I would be like I'd be like, "What? No. Really?" Yeah. No, well, I didn't not, handle not it that believe way. in her. Right, but well, also I, like, what was he yeah. doing? Yeah, well, and and it was like a super long embrace, and was a very like he was saying things in her ear that it wasn't. I, oh, and like, whoa, oh, yeah. Well, hold I, on I, now, I, Wait, well, hold on like, now. Not Talk like about. that. Not like that. Not like that. <laughs> not like that. But and and you know, if he like if he pulled in, 
and it wasn't ass out. You know how you like yeah, you yeah, hug yeah, somebody, yeah, yeah. you stick your ass out. Yeah. And if you yeah. pulled yeah. in, and all of a sudden you're, I, I mean, I probably would have noticed it and been like, like, bro, like, you okay? What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Why are you squeezing so hard? Like, but if it was also like in the her ear, like, whoa. Yeah, it it was definitely weird. It was there was no doubt about it. It was the. I guess what I'm trying to highlight is my response to it. You're yeah. an idiot. That's what you're trying to highlight. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I could have told you that. I don't know why we even have to <laughs> establish. You handled that, that all wrong. I just, I didn't. I don't. You probably told this story before. I just don't remember it. No, I don't think What's I have. You? A, you should feel worse about it now that you told me about it than you did <laughs> all the way up to this point. <laughs> oh, but, but the cool my. thing is, so yeah, we're going to talk about that. But then as well, you know. uh, Try to go right into the the, the, the the wife that stays at the house and you yeah. know business owners that come home at ten o'clock nine o'clock you know long right. hours yeah working six days seven days a week you know those kind of struggles that's that's what For we sure. really want to talk about well and I mean think about think about how many in our trade are doing that right now think yeah. about how many in our trade that that are technicians turned owners especially mm -hmm. that they think the way the business is going to be successful is by fixing all the cars yeah. And that's not how it works, right? You can fix all the cars in the world and not be successful. Yeah. And so, especially in the infancy of the infancy of the business, I think that's really important to hear that. And I think you've got a massive platform. I mean, you'll get people to listen just because it's you. So I think that's an awesome idea. Yeah. Before we dig all the way in, you've like done a lot of really cool stuff. For a lot of people in this industry, well, right? I want to do some self because introduce we're yourself. six minutes in, and all we heard was your stupid story. <laughs> like you've been in there. Well, I'm I'm trying to do this so you cut that part out so she never hears it and yells at us. <laughs> do you think she'd be upset by that story? She probably would. Really? Why really though? Well, because I, it just reminds her of what an ass I am. I think she knows. It would probably make it worse. And it's just funny because really? my wife tells me the same thing. Sometimes I just need you to listen. That's yeah, it. yeah, dude. Just, just listen. Yeah. Well, and and we need a listen, reminder. Don't of fix because <laughs> we're fixers. Yeah, yeah we're fixers. No, that's, that's what why. We do. Yeah, that's why I tell her. I'm like, let's do it this way. No, I just want you to listen. I know you're yeah. trying to fix up stuff. Do you but scream back at her? Go quit trying to change me. No, I'm the. I'm kinda, <laughs> I, <laughs> <laughs> no, because he's not trying to get killed. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. Introduce yourself. No, so uh, my name is. Uh, well, my actual name is Asael Sepulveda, and uh, everyone. So you nailed me. it. Yeah. Thank you. Boop. Can you can you show the world how you nailed it? Because I'm not going to be able to say that ever. <laughs> like I'm, I'm going to. It's Oz. Yeah, okay. that's why everyone calls me Oz. Uh, it's just easier, and it, it's kind of funny how I got that name. It was uh, during, I think, uh, high school. Yeah. There was a teacher that every time that we had a substitute teacher, I knew they were coming up to my name. Because they just kind of looked at the, the roll sheet, and yeah. they just they're stopped. struggling. Yeah, they, they're, they're, they just stopped. And the funny thing is, they just called everyone by their first name. They tried my first name, butchered it, and they're like, "Let me try the last name." I'm like, "Please <laughs> go to the next, go to the next person, please." <laughs> that's me, bro. <laughs> that's me. No, yeah. When I would see them struggle, that's when I raised my hand. It, th that's me. I'm I say it. And uh, that, that, that is awesome. That was extremely funny. But there's this one substitute teacher. He was like a rocker guy. Yeah. And he looks at it. He's like, uh, 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 dude, I'm gonna call you Ozzy. Oh, dude, that's awesome. He's like, do you mind if I can call you Ozzy? I'm gonna be, be here for a whole week. And I just looked at him and I was like, yeah, if you want to. So that's how Oz really? McKinney started. Yeah, it, it was pretty cool. So uh, from there, that's when my friends would call me Ozzy. And then when I finally opened up my shop, I sat down and I was trying to think of different names. My dad wanted Sepulveda Automotive or Sepulveda Shop or whatever. And I was just like, dad, if the teachers were struggling, yeah, I can just imagine someone trying to look up my shop and let's go to Sepultra. Like everyone that's that's what they say. Right. I'm like, I don't have a T in my, but so my friend came up to me and he was like, Hey Oz, he would call me Oz. He's yeah. like, why don't you just call it Oz mechanics? Yeah. And it was just like, Phew. and, and it's, it's become a household name, especially for YouTubers. Right. Yeah. Um, David did nail it. I'll mm -hmm. give him credit. <laughs> he absolutely nailed it. You did. I know I did. Anyway, let's move on past the name. <laughs> you, anybody ever tell you you get on my nerves? 
You ever, well, does, do you get on everybody else's nerves or is it just me? You're going to invalidate my feelings too? Is that how this is going to work? <laughs> Pretty much. Absolutely. But that's what you need in the podcast. You need that. Yes. Tom and Jerry kind of thing. You think thing. that's it? No. Yes. No. That's uh, not it. it. No. See, it can't be that because Tom is the violent one mm -hmm. and and you know powerful and capable and jerry is a smart one you were you were you <laughs> yeah. you laid into that and you went wait hold on now this, no, no. Is, this and, analogy is not gonna work i just threatened him on the last podcast recording so i'm obviously the violent one and then jerry's a smart ah, that's not gonna work. <laughs> no i was getting ready to say and you're neither one of those things <laughs> <laughs> Didn't let me get to the punchline. <laughs> no, that, uh, that that fell apart. Is all I'm saying. That fell apart. And and so tell us a little bit about what it is, who you are, because most of our listeners already know who you are. Mm -hmm. But but you got pretty popular on this thing called YouTube. Tell us how that happened. Uh, well, if everyone, pretty much everyone knows of Paul Danner, mm -hmm. Scanner Danner. Yeah. So yeah, it was it, it, it literally started off with that. Was watching one of his videos. And I got to the point where I was like, dude, if he helped me out, let me yeah. see if I can help out one person out there. Yeah. So that's where I got, you know, got the idea to at least make one video. Did I butcher that video? Yes. I, I called ahead an engine block. So <laughs> please, no one go over there and watch that first video. Don't do that. <laughs> and that was actually, uh, it was putting time search in a North, a North Star engine, a Cadillac. So, oh, uh, man. And dude, I went just head first, just straight I'm, to. We're going we're gonna to drop that in. Can we drop that into this video when we post? Do that. Do not do that. Do not do that. I don't want to do that. Do that. It's just uh, I, I just remember just rewatching it. I'm calling it a block, and I'm just like, not a lot of people have been. They didn't bring that up on the video. Now they are. Right, yeah. they're gonna go back and watch it. <laughs> Jesus, dude, that was just a uh, yeah. That was a horrible, horrible video. But going back to it, yeah, it was just a. Uh, it was a snowball effect, man. Just. Yeah. Uh, getting those comments and hey thank you for the help advice this is and right. that and uh it's just a wonderful thing man I, I really do enjoy it um we could say there's videos out there that i would not recommend watching uh kilmer uh, yeah, there you go don't, don't say there that name go. three times because it's like <laughs> he'll, the pop up. he'll pop up yeah. yeah he'll show up yeah he'll pop he's up a, he's an entertainment he's not he's okay. a smart guy uh Damn, I can't believe I'm saying he's a smart guy. He's a smart individual. <laughs> he's a YouTuber. Because, because what he yeah. does, and this is every technician that I talk to, he tells the masses what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I, and I didn't realize that until I was watching it when uh, someone commented on my video and they're like, why are you wasting my time? I don't have a scope. Yeah. You know, I don't have a $10,000 scan tool. I don't have this, this, and that. Right. I don't have all the fine, fancy equipment. It's like, why, why does this matter to me? Yeah, yeah, why does this matter to me? But Kilmer, he basically, everyone can relate to him. Yeah. You yeah. know? Well, and, and I think you're right. As an entertainer, he's brilliant, right? Because he's figured out exactly what to do. And, and I think to a degree, a lot of it is just satire, mm -hmm. right? Because isn't he, he's like on the Picoscope deal, right? Isn't he on Auto Nerds? Dude, I haven't Who? watched his. Kilmer. Isn't Scotty Kilmer like involved with auto nerds or something? Are you are you messing? No, what? I'm saying no, I, I really don't know. I, I, I don't either. But people were bringing it up the other day. We were talking about it in a in a chat, and it was that he's actually a very very accomplished technician, and that this is all just satire. That that's just how he rolls. I think that sounds like an internet theory. Like I don't know. <laughs> Somebody, I, that's what I'm saying. I don't know, know if it's true or not. <laughs> No, the thing is, and this really ticked me off one time. Yeah. Uh, a customer showed up to my shop and he rolls into my shop and he's like, hey, you're Oz. And then we introduced ourselves this, this yeah. and that. And he's like, hey, I just want you to look at my car, see if you can fix it up. And I was like, for sure. And then he starts just bawling, just telling me stuff. He's like, dude, so I'm bringing my car over here because I took it to Scotty Kilmer and he couldn't fix it. Do what? And I was like, okay. They're both in Houston. Yeah. Well, I know, but. No, he, well, he, but now he's in Tennessee. So oh, he, yeah, he, he left Houston. Right. And uh, so while he's telling me his whole story, uh, he's like, dude, the messed up thing that he did, 
is after I picked up my car two days later, he makes a video about my car and basically just talking mess about it. Holy crap. Yeah. What kind of what kind of dummy is going to put, you know, a spoiler? What kind of dummy is going to put an uh, air intake, this, this, and that, just bashing that it? That screwed up. And then the customer, while, while he's telling me this whole thing, he's like, hey, I didn't put this. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. I didn't do none of that. So yeah. he's tell, he's telling me all this. And I'm like, dude, I don't care what you put on your car. Right. That's your business, bro. Yeah, yeah. I'm just here to fix it up. That's it. I don't yeah. care what you have on there. I'm here to fix it up. So I did record the video. And it was just a mass airflow sensor. That's all it was. Simple. Any technician can do this. Yeah. But Scotty, he got to the point where he was just like, I'd rather get a little bit more, you know, recognition. Well, m- yeah. more views just by making this video and talking mess about this car than, than even working on the car, or fixing yes. the cars. That's screwed up. That's really yeah, screwed up. Uh, that, I mean, it makes, it makes sense. Like you're going to, they're just props. Yeah. You're not there to, no. you're not a shop. You can't be a shop. Like, you can't do what he does. The amount of editing. Do you do a lot of editing your yes. videos? Yeah. Then so David goes. Work. <laughs> yeah, I just hit, I post. That's it. <laughs> post. Done. It's just YouTube is, uh, it's difficult. You know, uh, to me is really difficult. Yeah. Um, you have so many subscribers that you're trying or so many people out there that you're trying to, you know, get that certain group. And especially in what we do, uh, all the technical stuff, you have the small niche, right? Yeah. There. It's it, a, it, yeah. Yeah. You're, I mean, you're a huge YouTube channel, but you're also like in a small, niche. you're not Scotty Kilmer size. You see yeah. what I'm saying? Like you're not donut media. Yeah they're not they're not making content for uh, wh- who you serve yeah does that make sense yeah like your your audience is technically minded they're actually mechanics they actually work on cars they work in shops these people just want entertainment so scotty's just putting he just needs a prop so it was just that guy's car and and you know we talked about that yesterday is is some content creators are trying to make that shift from funny and irrelevant content that gets tons of views to serious content. Yeah. And I think that's a hard road to hoe, right? Because like trying to switch to where you're providing that value and having, you know, people take you seriously, like Scotty Kilmer tried to make the flip. That's never going to happen, right? Nobody's going to watch it. All those subscribers that have signed up would never. He does those videos where he's like talking about cars, like he's answering subscriber questions. Those do pretty well. Do they? Well, it's, most of his questions are just, well, he'll talk about a, a certain line or yeah. he'll say, oh, you know, GM is not doing good or this, this, and that. Yeah. And he'll have one of those. But you know who's really doing good? Uh, Eric from South Main Auto. Yeah. 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 I it, love it, his channel. And so I, I did call him one time and I was like, Eric, how can I get to your level? And he's like, Oz, you're doing good. Yeah. But he's like, just. Do what you're doing, and it's going to get there. But I went to this one event mm-hmm. in Vegas. Uh, you know, Pat Ben David and all them. Yeah. 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 So they yeah. had an event. Value the, yeah. Yeah. So they had an event. It was like a it was like a mastermind event, but then they had YouTubers as well. Oh, that's cool. Dude, so it was, a, yeah, it was, it was really nice because I was going there for the financial purpose, but yeah. then I found out that the YouTubers were there as well, and they were giving all these tips and so on. Right. And what really hit home, I was just like, the way this one guy, I think his name is Pat Flynn. Yeah. 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 Pat mm-hmm. Flynn. Uh, Smart passive income. Yeah. Yeah. So what he was talking about is whenever you have a channel, imagine watching The Simpsons and all you have is Homer Simpson. Yeah. How boring is that going to get for, you know, 10 years? Right. 10 seasons. No, you have. You need to have those peripherals. You need mm-hmm. to have that Barney, that... Yeah. Lisa, the bar that rounded out. Yeah. And that's what Erico is doing. Yeah. He brings his daughter, the the dogs there, Sheba. You got uh, his wife, different characters that come in. Mm-hmm. And then as well, you have to be relatable to your audience. So what yeah. does Eric say? Oh, I love ice cream. What do people send him? Ice, ice cream. cream. Yep. You know, he has his hats. 
You know, people send them hats. That 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 kind of that stuff. is that's a really good point. Super valid point. Were you trying to get free hats? Is that what the deal is? <laughs> no, he was trying to get me to say something about bourbon, so I got free bourbon. You have gotten free bourbon. I know it's awesome. It's fantastic. We're a teeny, tiny channel compared to you, obviously, but mm-hmm. will we get free bourbon? Dude, that's and that's that the crazy? thing. Just bring it up, or yeah, he doesn't drink bourbon, no. so I'd get the bourbon. Actually, it's probably rolling around in the back of his it van. It's rolling around the back of my van. Yeah, well, everyone knows me as a tequila guy. We talked yeah. about it downstairs. Yeah. It, was, it was really, it was, it was really funny. So, the first event I came to, uh, I just had one shot of tequila. They know I'm Mexican, so they just, they just went along with it. So every time I would come to an event, everyone's like. Oh, there's a tequila guy. The first time I met Paul. Yeah. It, it, so first time I met Paul, it was at a big event. And, um, you know, he, I looked up to this guy. Yeah. You know, yeah. We all did, man. Like yeah. that, he was like the, the catalyst of so much of what's happening in our industry right now. Yeah. The catalyst of this channel in a lot of ways. Right. Mm-hmm. And so like so much of, of what our industry is right now is yeah. because Paul had his hand in it. You uh-huh. know what I'm saying? But, but the funny thing is when I met him at the bar, I'm walking up to him and he's like, no, I, I heard about you. But he said more words. He's like, I heard about you. Get away from me, Oz. <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, no, dude, I heard about you. Please stay away from me. And I was just like, oh, what I do? Well, yeah, what's going on? He's like, you always tell everyone to drink tequila. And I was like, well, you're not going to drink one with me? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah we took a shot well, more than one just shot so right yeah it was, it was a fun night man that is paul is an amazing person he is dude he really is he is an amazing people. person uh just i always tell everyone when you meet paul just don't fanboy it just, yeah just talk to him like a normal person yeah yeah he's really cool man when you just next just, level human being right there for sure i man. mean absolutely next level human being yeah. there, there's no doubt about it and and you know that brings us back around. I, you've done some. You, you've used your channel for good in a lot of ways, and you've done a lot of things for a lot of people. And you've had the giveaways, and you've done all that stuff. What's the catalyst for that? Like, what what drives you to do that? It's just this industry, man. Just the people I see here, the people I meet yeah. here. I don't know. They're not friends. They're just they're family. Yeah. To me, every time I come to these events, I'm like a little boy. Even my wife, she's like, she'll play around with me. She'll be like, all right, go play with your friends. Because that, <laughs> <laughs> it's just that, that connection that we have, man. Yeah. It's just beautiful, man. Uh, even right after COVID, yeah. I just remember the when they finally opened it up. Dude, I left my wife in the car. Like I, would, I just ran over here. Right. Just saw Tommy, saw everyone, just hugged him. And it was just, it was just amazing. I met. And that's what I just want more people to have that. Yeah, that, that that kind of feeling. You know, the first time I when I first came here, I was I was kind of scared, man. I was I didn't know who yeah. I was going to meet. Uh, Mike Molesky was one of the first people I met. Yep. And he, if he hear, if he listens to this, for sure. And and like, man, I, I'm with you because there's so many memories that I have at this show in particular, and ASTE, and and it's the it is really the pathway. To making our industry better, for like sure. truly making it better for the technicians in the industry, making it better for the the service advisors in the industry, making it better for the owners and everybody. And so you did something really cool because when at a time, and and I'll tell you the backstory behind this. So my good friend Ben mm-hmm. reaches out. They were expecting, but they had a good while before the baby was due. And he sends me a message and he says, "Hey, guess I'm not coming to Vision." And I said. I'm, I'm like, I see him typing on Facebook. And then all of a sudden pops up this picture of his new little girl, right? Yeah. And she was born prematurely. And he's like, I can't leave. I have to be here. He's like, can you help me give this away? And I said, well, go make a post on Facebook. And so what you didn't know is that Ben had just reached out to me and he said, I see why more people don't do scholarships. And I said, what do you mean? He said, all of these people are wasting my time. They're telling me that Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would love to go. I would love to go. And then I message them, and they don't message me back. And then they finally do message, or I'll answer, I'll call them. And they won't know who this person is working at this shop. And I'll say, well, hey, you know, he applied to come to Vision, and I was going to give a ticket away. And they're like, oh, there's no way that person could go. And he said, I, I have literally spent four hours this morning trying to work through this. And then, like, minutes later, you send me a <laughs> message, and I'm like, ah. And so you facilitated somebody to come to Vision. Yeah. 
that got a free ticket, got a free trip to the the dinner that Nathan's putting on. Man, that that's phenomenal. Why did you do that? So when we had the main giveaway, uh, yeah. I worked with Sherry, mm-hmm. wonderful person. Yeah, Dude, she's amazing for sure. Yeah, and uh, we had I think it was like two hundred and fifty entries yeah. for the for the main giveaway, and just the. Uh, all the entries, it was like, I think it was a thousand words or less just to write in. Yeah. And I could just see the passion. I can, the passion that, that yeah. all these technicians that really wanted to make it to vision. So I got to that point where there's this one guy, he kept on messaging me. Yeah. Please, I, I really want to go. And I was like, look, man, we, we have a panel that we have to go through. Yeah. I just, I, 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 I can't it's up just, to them. Yeah, I can't yeah. override it. Yeah. yeah, I can't override that. And then we picked our winner. the The first winner that got it, he he backed out. Okay. Then I called this other guy. He made it. the The one who kept on contacting me, he was third in place. So that day that you put that post, yeah, I called him and I was just like, Jesse, if I if I could tell you right now that you can go to Vision, we can get you some tickets to yeah. the training event. Would you go? And he's like, "Are you serious?" He's like, "I have a. Re- I'm gonna meet up with a realtor today." Are you joking with me? And I was like, "No, I really need to know. It's not set in stone, but would you make it?" And yeah. he's like, "Give me about five minutes." I was like, "All right, I will call you exactly in five minutes." And that's right. when we were texting. Yeah. And then, as soon as I called him, he's like, "We're li- we're looking for plane tickets. We're ready to go." It, that's what I want. Yeah. Those kind of people, I, I want the people who are yeah. fired up and ready to do it. Yeah, yeah. and so I, I was, I was like on the road to the airport, and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, I don't know if there's any way we have enough time to make this happen, right? <laughs> and so it was so crazy that it actually worked. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And and I, I will commit to um, if you want to send somebody to Vision or to a ASTE, I guess it's ASTA Expo this year. You're going to yes. make it? <laughs> Bless you, buddy. That looks I just got rough. choked up about this vision story. Um, I, you could hold it in. I will, I will um, cover the attendance for okay. one person awesome. uh, to send them to the ASTA Expo. Awesome. And so I will, I will pay for that to well, send somebody. Yeah, so. we'll, we'll work something out, man. For sure. Um, what, what do you hope that when talking about that guy that was able to come, what do you hope? that he walks away with. Same thing that we all did when yeah. we first came, came here. Yeah. Yeah. Th- th- that's what I'm really hoping for. Uh, you know, just the excitement. I don't know. That yeah. th- That's what I got out of it. You know, when I first came to this event, it was that yeah. excitement. Right. I'm just looking forward to all these training events. That's, that's the main thing. And some, and you can talk, to, if you talk to the, Regulars that come here a lot. Yeah. Sometimes they say, well, you know, we've already taken these same classes over and over, but it's just the people that we meet. Yeah. And that's where we get excited as well. For sure. I think I get the most value out of these events from the networking yes. and sitting around and talking. And, and you know, I tell people all the time, the, the events are really to help you understand that you're part of something much bigger. Mm-hmm. And, and this is a much bigger industry than you think it is. And there's a whole lot more going on than you think is going on. Um, and, and I think there's so much opportunity. You, you network with a lot of technicians, right? Your, yeah. your primary following is technicians. Our primary following is shop owners. And so a lot of the shop owners, especially the ones that listen to the show, are, are the top of the top. They yeah. want to make things better. They want to improve the shops. What are you hearing from the technicians? When, when you talk to them, are, are there pain points that they're feeling right now? that we're not covering, you know, we talk a lot about wages and we talk about benefits and we talk about paid time off and we talk about all these things. Are there areas that you think we're missing it in the industry? Most of the technicians that I talk to, the only thing that they really, you know, the only thing that they talk about is just, can we, can they pay for our training? That's pretty much it. Yeah. You know, hands down, that's, that's the only thing that they really kind of complain about. Well, and you know what's so interesting about that is we had five or six shops in the changing the industry group that were talking about, hey, we've paid for their training. Mm-hmm. We're, we're offering to take them to AST. We're offering to take them to Vision. We're offering to take them to STX. And they won't go. And so, like, how do you – and and is that just a case of the wrong technician? I mean, what is that? I would say so because 
look, I, I did go to, I'm not going to say what training event I went to. It was over there in Houston. Yeah. The instructor was more, he's trying to just be more comical than anything. Yeah. And after class, I went up to him and I was just like, hey, dude, I'm here to learn. Yeah. And he's like, well, we have a contract with the city of Houston that brings us 90% of the students here. Right. So if I don't keep them entertained, we Were lose you? that contract. Oh, that's crazy, dude. dude that's, uh, that's an that issue. That was nuts, dude. Yeah. The, it, the fact that they... <laughs> The fact that they're too worried to actually teach. Was there just not any substance to this training? Because, I mean, you can be entertaining and also teach something. Like, it doesn't have to be exclusive. Yeah, but most of the people that are, that are going to that those training events are just, you know, knuckle-busting, that kind of stuff. They yeah. don't want to know about all the technical stuff. Yeah. It was kind of sad that one time we went, I went to this training event that SMP was offering. Mm -hmm. It was a lab scope class. That was my first lab scope class. Yeah. Guess how many students were there? How many? Two. Yeah. Yeah. We, and, and, and we one, see it. Yeah. And, and the second student, so it was me and this other guy, he went there because his wife made him go there. Wow. Yeah. And he was complaining the whole time. Why am I going to scope something if I can just change out this part? Yeah. He's not wrong. It just seems out see if it works. I, it's it's just fixed. Enough. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's cheap. Enough. It's cheap. Come on, yeah. man. We got to roll out this car. But, but hold on, though. Yeah. All right. We we had this discussion at my shop the other day. I I, I have a pickup in the shop. It's an 86 Toyota, mm -hmm. and it has no fire. Okay? And I said, look. I said, because this, sim this system is so simple, right? Instead of dragging on a scope card over here, 90% of the time, it's the pickup and the distributor that's bad. If not, like you've got an igniter, a coal, and the pickup. That's all there is to this system. And the amount of time that we can actually test it, can we test can the like distributor with a with a test light though. You, you can okay. You can. And so, um, we put a pickup in it, and because I did not have a, a pickup signal, right? Put a pickup in it, doesn't fix it. And I was like, man, okay. So we we gommed around with it a little bit. And I uh, just just for poop's sake threw an igniter in it. I knew the coal was good, and it still didn't fix it. And so you enter into the world of automotive parts today. <laughs> Guess what? The new parts were both bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, you're talking about the '86 long. Toyota. Like you're getting the most like Chinesium parts. Ever because who's you're not going to get a quality part for an '86 Toyota. I, I mean, I guess my point crusher. is is that as bad as parts have gotten right now, there is no chance that I'm going to do Swaptronics because mm -hmm. there's a good chance I'm not going to fix it with the new part either. No, maybe I I had a the the location that that I opened my first shop in uh, or I first opened in there was a Euro shop in there, and he he was. He moved to like a couple doors down from me, and he would bring me cars. And he's like, "Hey, can you diagnose this?" Okay, yeah, we'll we'll give it a shot. We would tinker around with it. And we're like, well, it looks like this thing here has power ground. It's not working. And he's like, "Well, okay, go ahead. We're gonna go ahead and send you one from World Pack. If it doesn't fix it, just put it back in the box. We'll send it back." To them. <laughs> That's how they dealt with their diagnostics. They just kept throwing parts at it. They'd put the part on. Hey, does it work? No. Take it back out, put it back in the box, ship it back to World Pack. World Pack took it back. For and he, this went on for years, Holy years and years. Smokes. Yeah. So that's how they managed it, dude. You would not believe how many shops in my community do just that. And and I have talked to a number of the other folks in my community, and and they will openly tell you, like, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. That's what I want to do. There, there's one particular shop. I won't say it's in my community. It's nearby, um, and all of their all of their employees. None of their employees are are paid on the books. They're all paid cash, right? None of them are technicians. And I'm I'm asking him like, hey, what's the logic behind that? Like, it's kind of hard to fix cars like that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. These aren't true professional technicians. There, and he said, man, he said I make all my money in tires and brakes. 
I have zero reason. I have zero need to do any of that. I'm not interested in it. I was like, right, but everybody in town calls you the best auto repair shop in town. He's like, man, he's like, we just, if, if it's something simple, he said, if it's complex, we send it to you. He said, if it's something simple, we like change a couple parts. And if it doesn't change anything, we send it to you. He's like, I, I, that doesn't bother me. That Like you say, me guessing, like it's a bad thing. It's a good thing for me. I'm, I'm okay doing that. I'm happy doing that. I make money doing that. And I'm like, yeah, but, but like the industry as a whole, that looks bad for all of us. Now the clients come to us and they're completely content with what just happened. They don't have a problem with it. And I, sh- I shared that thing this morning from a from a client of ours who said that was the only time I felt like I actually paid a testing fee and got my money's worth. Right. So does he charge diagnosing that one shop? No, no. Have Just, you, they bring you, the car in and he he changes parts and if it doesn't run, then he bills them for the parts he put on it and sends it out. That's how they work. But if he can't figure it out, he sends it to you, right? Yeah. Have you ever had it where? Uh, this happened to me actually twice where a customer came over. I gave them my uh, diagnosing price per hour. They said, no, they took it to the shop down the street, which I work for. And yeah. then that car came over to my shop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dude, <laughs> and, it has happened. And, it has had, happened and so I'm still times. charging diagnosing. That's the thing. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not bringing the price down and I'm still charging that shop, the diagnosing fee. Right. I don't know what he said to, uh, to get him in the door. Or yeah. wh- where he's going to move the diagnosing fee and, yeah. and move it around, but that was kind of crazy. And uh, and but and, but the only other thing I don't like is that now he is the shop that everyone loves because he's fixing yeah, the car. He's fixing the car, and this other shop right here, Oz, wants to charge me one fifty an hour for diag. Do you think that he? It's possible he got a brake job and maybe a lower control arm and he just he maybe padded that a little bit to offset oh no this uh, was a this was mainly diag it was a electrical problem he wasn't doing anything else on the car no Hmm. but sometimes they'll just make up stories and they'll say oh uh, it was underneath the dash and we had to pull it out that's twelve hundred dollars or whatever this this is what i'm talking about like you can't like it's the people so flippantly lie just to you see what i'm saying like well it's not really hurting anybody we get paid the cuss the car's fixed so who cares that we're telling them we pulled the dash out you you didn't pull the dash out you didn't you didn't do any of that like you're lying to the customer yeah like and and, and that's wrong no matter how you slice it you're okay with that well i I don't know i just i can't do it i can't do it we see that I, so- I deliberately tell my employees i'm like like oh, i'll just tell them this I'm like don't tell them that do not lie we don't lie he's like okay i'll say it like this i'm like oh well, you're okay there <laughs> I, I, we we've seen so much of that move to uh, by by a lot of these shops is the move to we're not going to charge you to do testing mm-hmm. and so they bring the car in they find the easy work on the car they might actually do testing for one specific problem but if it's complex they just send it out and so why is that well it's because we're not in a model where we're charging enough for testing that it's profitable right does that make sense in other words like because if you look at testing let's say that that um for instance in my shop right now is a car that got hit by lightning okay and it was a mess and it yeah, and it was a it was a friend of ours car, and the the son had been driving it. It's an Audi TT, and this was in a lot of turmoil in this family, and they were going through some real serious, really scary stuff. And I said, let me just buy the car, right? Yeah, we had played around with it a little bit. Uh, Eric initially thought that it was just the cluster, and the the cluster was dead, no doubt about it. But once we put the cluster in it, we started finding like more and more and more. Once one's been hit by lightning, dude, yeah, it's all all bets are off, right? And so, as that plays out, Noah's been working on this week, and Noah's spent better than twenty hours to get down to the point that he's got the dash out of the car, and he's found one connector with one wire in it that was the whole root of the problem. When it got hit, it melted the connector together. And it melded two wires together in the connector. I'll show you a picture of it here in a minute. And so how would you charge that if a customer walked in? Right. And so even if you do, let, let's say that you charge 150 bucks an hour and you, you work on it for 20 hours. Well, the problem is, is that a, a typical repair shop is like a 1.85 to 2.0 
parts to labor ratio. Mm -hmm. So in other words, like it's one to one somewhere. So it can't right be one fifty. It needs to be. It would have to be three hundred yeah. to make up the same amount of money for doing the testing. And so David, if it I, actually takes up twenty hours of, of yeah. shop time and like actual bay time, twenty hours. It's going to have to be three hundred, or not exactly three hundred, but like two hundred and eighty-five dollars. Right. And so if you look at that, and now you're saying, okay, well, so all of these technicians have built so much into their life of I want to be able to do the most complex diag and fix the most complex cars. And and I think in training, a lot of this education system that we've built is trying to encourage them to learn this really complex task. And we say, well, we need a techs that can do high-end diag. But now the market is not really there to pay them, right? Because most consumers are unwilling to pay for that testing. you got shops that are siphoning out the gravy work, and they're taking that. They're not even interested in doing testing. And then the shops that are doing testing are saying, well, I can't really pay that guy $150,000 a year to do my least profitable type of work. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so David and I had a really in-depth conversation about that last night and, and talking a little bit about how – and and I, maybe you, you best take the, the way you explained it. But he says – we're coming back from dinner, and he's like, I, I'm not saying anything about that on another podcast because people already hate me for the last time I said something. <laughs> but, I, I literally said that to him. He's like, hey, yeah. you know, I'm going to bring it up on the very next podcast we do. Okay. Yeah. No, but, this is the second one. But in your area, how many other shops actually charge for diagnosing? Like, I, I've, got, I've got two other shops within 50 miles of me that charge for testing. Mine all do. They may not actually do any diagnostic testing, yeah. uh -huh. but they'll slap diagnostic fee on the on the yeah. ticket for a hundred yeah. bucks or one hundred fifty bucks. But that that's always been the mentality. The mindset's always been like, well, we're going to scan it. It's a crank sensor code. We're going to unplug it. The wires look okay. We got power and ground, and then we're going to throw the sensor on there, and then it'll be diagnostic fee hundred dollars. R and R crank sensor, crank sensor, and the car goes. Yeah. So okay, that's been the majority of diagnostic work mm -hmm. right up until like maybe early 2010s mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden the cars got stupid and they get getting stupider and stupider and stupider and now they are so stupid and i the consumer doesn't know the consumer doesn't understand hey you know that google thing that's on your dash it's talking to 80 other things Really? Yeah, they're all talking together. And guess what? That one there goes down. It takes down like seven other ones. But we don't know which one because there's seven in the line. And by the way, we have four different networks on this one car. Networks? Yeah. Anyway, it's going to be $600 for me to even look at the car. Oh, I don't understand. The shop down the street told me they could do it for 150 Okay, take it down there. See what happens. See what happens. Then he gets mad at me that I'm dad voicing the customer because that's how I would say it. <laughs> Go ahead and take it down there and see what happens. I'm just telling you right now, they don't have a flipping clue what I just said. Yeah. Just like you don't, I understand, but you're not the mechanic. They need to know this stuff. They don't. So what are you going to do? Oh, I guess I'll just leave it there. Okay, then. $600. Go ahead and approve it. Make sure you click the yes on shopware. <laughs> I don't sign. Get in, yeah, and sign because I don't want to get into that mess. What really helped me out was I got to the point where I was the specialty shop. Yeah. That's what really helped it out. Because if you're that normal mechanic shop or normal repair place and you're going to tell them, hey, we're going to charge you X amount for diagnosing, with, they put you in the same tier as the next shop down the street. Yeah. That's a regular uh, maintenance place or mechanic shop, whatever. And they're like, well, they're not charging. So why the heck are you charging? But now if you're that specialty shop yeah, and you're known for be, being a diagnostician, that's when they know. It's, it's, like, it's like going to the doctor and all that. You, stuff. you get the specialist. In, and Yeah, but uh, take a step back and look at it and go, uh, if, if you didn't have, like, if you didn't have the name recognition, like, you're also the guy on YouTube. You're, like, you're famous. The, the, and so, but not in, in my area. They don't know me as a YouTuber. To be quite honest, they know me as the the guy, the guy who fixed the yeah, car. Who's going to get it fixed? So here, here's the other side of that, though, right? Is that? 
but a simple Google search is going to come up with it. You see what I'm saying? Like it's not there. There's a the there's a guy named the I think he calls himself Mechanic OC. Okay. Um, do you know who I'm talking about? No, I have, no, I haven't checked it out. But um, I'll, he's I'll been, look on, him up he's been on YouTube for forever. Okay. Um, he's been on YouTube for anyway. He he opened up a shop. Um, and he considers them like he does like seventeen different things. It's not I just own a shop because he's like a one man shop, but he's a one man shop that also has like I've got a clothing line and I do this and do real estate and he's like he's one of those kind of guys. Anyway, he he um if you look up his shop, uh he's got a Yelp review. He's he's in California, so yep. Yelp, right? And the Yelp's like no wonder my sh- my car took a month to get back he's doing, he's on youtube doing youtube videos all the day long i think and I remember these seven about other that. businesses he can't get i guess my question for you then becomes as a specialty shop mm-hmm. you have to be comfortable charging those extra hours oh, sure and charging those extra dollars but he is that's the point right yeah i'm i'm comfortable with that that but there's a lot who are who are saying hey i want to follow in these footsteps and they were technicians turned owners, and then they don't, right? Mm-hmm. And they they get to the point that they want to be heroes, and they want to fix the car. And so now, guess what? They get this car, and it's a complex problem. Audi TT been hit by lightning. Yeah. And they spend 60 hours on it. And we don't fix the car, or we spend 60 hours, we don't charge the client. You, you know what I mean? And like, so I think there has to be a step where we normalize, especially with the consumer, that modern automobiles are expensive to fix. For sure. And and there's a cost associated with that that we don't necessarily control. Yes, we could charge you less, but I still have to be profitable, right? The business still has to make money. I'm not doing this for my health, and I'm not doing it for good looks because God sakes, look at David. Uh, <laughs> handsome, but, handsome guy. Yeah. <laughs> I had a cardboard cutout of myself. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank God they blurred it up. Um, did you see that? Did you? Yeah, I did see that. And you notice that mine, Monique, points out like midway through this thing. She's like, have you really looked at, at your cardboard cutout? Yeah. And I was like, really looked at it? And she's like, come with me. Uh-huh. Look really close. Mm-hmm. And so like when the picture was taken, there was like a shadow near my crotch. <laughs> so it looks like there's this wet spot on my crotch. And she's like, do you know how many people have touched your crotch because of that tonight? And I'm like, oh, man. I, I kept turning around and looking and people were pointing at my crotch taking pictures. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, I gotta go check it out. No, I got to see those pictures. <laughs> Center pictures. That's hilarious. No, but so like if a customer brings his car over to my shop and it's, let's say, pre-2004, yeah, I'm going to deny that job. Yeah. To be quite honest. I'm, I'm For gonna, sure. You got to know which jobs you're going to take. Which mm-hmm. where you 2004? Very specific. Why? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Well, that's the year I, gra- I went to school in 05, and we worked on 05 and up. And I don't know, just older vehicles, I just don't feel as comfortable. I don't know yeah. why. Yeah. Just I'm, older vehicles. I'm at 2000 like right a, now. Is kind it's of where a generational, we because you know, 2000 Dakota comes in your, you stay away from that mother effer. You yeah. stay away from that <laughs> vehicle. Have you had a bad just, experience? Oh, my goodness. Distributor, mm-hmm. 2000 Dakota. I don't care if it's a 2000. That's a no. But when they switch body styles yeah. and they go to the newer yeah. setup, it's like, okay, well, I'll do that. The Durango, when they actually made the first Durango, was also that that second-gen Dakota or whatever, that yeah. third-gen Dakota. But the older ones, the distributors, like, hell no, because I've tried. Yeah, They're not fixable. And, and they have ghosts in the machine. <laughs> have you ever worked on like those eighties with all the evap lines everywhere? Yeah, dude, Jeez. those are fun. You know, <laughs> the, and, and the, I can tell. I can tell you went to school in the two thousands. Yeah, I can tell yeah. just from your like, what is all this? Those are vacuum lines to do what? Everything. Why not run wires? We didn't have wires back then. <laughs> You don't you don't have defrost <laughs> if that line's busted. Uh, well, you know those are those are valid points, and I think that so ex- an old school like like eighties Japanese car that they're, when they they're first cool. got fuel injection, hell yeah, they're Dude. they're they can be cool cars, okay. Uh-huh. But but it comes down to why does the consumer own the car, 
right? If if that consumer owns the car because they can't afford anything else, then they probably can't afford for me to solve its problems. You if know. the consumer owns the car because this was my wife's first car and I really love it and she's not with us anymore and I want to, that, that's a different conversation, right? Yeah. Uh, it, I just, I see too many shops trying to be the hero and, and we've put so much emphasis on this high-end Diag and all of the high-end Diag training that we do that it may have created an illusion that in our current state, the way we're doing things, Diag is profitable and that's where the money's at and we all need to train to be better Diag techs. But if we don't either start charging more or come up with a different strategy for handling this, we're, we're training techs for positions that don't exist. Now, shops think they no, exist. No, no, no. We're training techs towards a skill that does not make any money. Right. Well, I mean, that's why I'm saying the position doesn't well, really exist. The position exist. still is needed. Yeah. And it's a, it's a high skill. It's a high-skilled position. Takes a ton of education to get there. Doesn't make you a dime. Because the consumer doesn't see value in it. So do how do we fix it? It's that? like having a double doctorate in dance theory, lesbian dance theory. Now, now that's some interesting <laughs> dance theory, David. Now you can <laughs> drop $150,000 in schooling to get your double doctorate in lesbian dance theory. But are you going to get your money back? Other than becoming an instructor in lesbian dance theory, or I'm going to get you your doctorate in lesbian dance theory. I talked to an instructor one time, and he said that liberal arts, that they had this program that was all liberal arts, and he said, do you know that approximately 98% of those that graduated with a liberal arts degree from that university ended up working in the fast food industry? <laughs> And I'm like, dude, what? He's like, swear to God, that's the number. Dude, so this is what my dad told me, uh, told my brother. Damn, I know this isn't, sounds messed up. So my dad came from first, uh, you know, everyone's from Mexico. He's the uh, he's, he's, uh, only one that came over to the United States. Mm -hmm. And he told me. I'm not Mexican, by the way, Lucas. I know you? you heard that and you're like, yeah, David I knew is it. too. I knew it. So when he came over, <laughs> <laughs> when he came over, he told my brother, he's like, hey, what you need to do is go to the classes that the Asian people or an Indian people are going to. And I was like, dad, that's kind of messed up. So I remember my brother, he graduated in an arts degree and I think 98% of the names were Johnson. Uh, Smith, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then when they had the graduating class for, uh, for all the uh, doctors and all that, it was all the Indian and Asian names. And I was like, Holy smokes. He was onto he, something. Yeah. yeah. He was a hundred percent onto something. He said, yeah, because the other, you know, from other nations that come over here, they see an opportunity and ju they jump on it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. They jump on that. Well, they, they've never had opportunity like that. And I, 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 I don't what are know. What talking about? You're nuts. They, they, have, they have schools there, too. No, you know? They up, come over with their own doctorates. <laughs> so I, I watched this video the other day. I don't know how I came across it. And it's three Indian guys. And they're sitting in front of the school that they attended in India. And they tell their story about this massive corporation that they started. And they, they came to the U.S. and they got their PhDs. And they all came together and they said, everybody else comes here and they end up staying here in the U.S. And they, they work in their field and they have all of these opportunities, all of these things. And they tell their story about why it was they chose to go back to India. It was extremely fascinating. And they started like a marketing company. It's unbelievable, like the story of how they got there and, and the work that they did to be able to get to the U.S. financially, to be able to go to school here, right? And he, I'll never forget one of the things he said was, he said, I had to recognize that by me coming back to India – that I would never make the amount of money that I would have made if I stayed in the U.S. He said, I had I had six-figure offers in the U.S. that I will never have coming back here. I came back here because I love my country. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, that is a really insightful way to look at that education system. Because, I mean, he talked about the, the pathway just to get to the U.S. to get that education was insane, right? And, and we've talked to Now all you have to do... <laughs> Is walking the. <laughs> it's just, yeah. And then Dude. they'll give you a bus ride and a debit card, and you get dropped off somewhere in New oh, York. That's only for the Chinese. <laughs> well, yeah, mostly Chinese. That's uh, really interesting. 
What is it? What else? Uh, the, These are wealthy Chinese people coming across the border. Well, that's for a specific reason. They've got an agenda. You think so? Well, because they started they started finding out what was going on in the universities because they were also coming in as exchange students. Mm-hmm. Are you familiar with this? No, I like I, I, the, I don't the, even watch the news. That's the thing. Oh God, yeah. we set David off. I'm I don't, sorry. We don't, hold on, we don't watch the news. I don't watch the news. Who watches the news? But also. Uh, you like? Do you have any kids? Uh, one. Okay, so your kid is going to be like, "Hey, I'm going to go to the University of Texas, Pasadena. Or I don't know what schools they have down there, but I'm just and you're kind of close. Okay, to so you're gonna you're gonna Pasadena. within ten percent. You're you're gonna have no idea why the entire classroom is just Chinese kids, uh-huh. and they're not native born Chinese kids. They are Chinese Chinese kids from mm-hmm. China, and you're like, "What the hell is going on?" Well, there's a thing. And they're they're infiltrating the the you know the school the state schools. Mm-hmm. Anyway, we won't go down that rabbit hole. It depends. It depends on what part of the country the they emigrate to, because your dad had he land is he from Mexico? Yeah. Did he come over? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was I was born in Mexico. We're, okay, we're okay. all born you're in Mexico. All, yeah, you're, you guys are purebreds. That's why he's so successful. I don't like the mud. <laughs> <laughs> Should we point out that you have tonal privilege? Is this where we're supposed to say this in this episode? I don't think he knows, which is going to freak him out a little bit because I'm going to say super racist stuff, and he's going to be like, <laughs> "I don't think he's supposed to say that." It freaks people out. Anyway, um, you're you're it, sitting it with the only dude in the no, country on, who's on, willing to walk into a restaurant and explain that he has tonal privilege. It's okay. <laughs> tonal privilege. I explained that to Carrie. I freaked her out too. Anyway. Um, had had he gone to a different part of the country? Had he not gone to Mex- to, to Texas? I'm just telling you right now. This is how it goes. Had he gone to California? That's and, where he started off at, and, and stayed there, uh-huh. and not gone anywhere else. And it, like how old? Twenty. He was working with my grandmother for a little while, but then they ended up settling in the Northeast. There, you talk to anybody. Not born here, but moved in, right? What do you need to do? All of it, all of it is centered around going to college or university. Mm-hmm. All of it. You just got to get your degree. In what? They don't tell you. You just got to get your degree. Well, you got to make sure. So you can do what? I can get a good job with really good benefits. Okay. Who's going to hire me? And what degree in what exactly? Like, what am I supposed to be doing here? They don't tell you. You just got to get a degree. Everybody obsessed with getting degrees. My cousins, they all have degrees. Why? Because their parents settled in the Northeast and they all got told, you got to go to school. You got to get a great degree. And what? I don't know. Anyway, get a good job so you can have some good benefits. That was it. That was everything was centered around there. At no point did the words, maybe start a business. Figure out what you're really good at and that you get up every single yeah. morning excited to do and go do that. Figure out a way to make money doing that. It's a thousand opportunities now. We have the internet. It's great. Internet's cheap. And devices are cheap. You can figure something out. Those words never came out. And then also we we're in like 80s and 90s. That wasn't a thing. But it wasn't like, hey, go down to the library and figure out what you're good at. I, I used to love to draw. That was my thing. Like mm-hmm. I used to and I told my parents, I'm like, I'm gonna be a comic book artist. Because that's what I wanted to do. And it wasn't like, okay, let's figure this out. Let's make you a comic book artist. Who do we need to like practice this many hours a day? Send your work in. Let's figure out who we need to send it to. The big studios. Maybe you can get a small, a small pay, uh, um, publication to pick you up so you can do some art. Maybe you send them different things. No, no. It was that ah, you need to go to college <laughs> so you can get a good job with those bennies. You know what my mom did. She went to college. She got a good a degree, an absurd degree that she's. What was it? Um, sociology. She was a master's in sociology. You know what sociologists <laughs> make? Social workers yeah. make nothing. They make nothing. I pay everybody 
in my shop more than the average social worker makes. She has a master's from Boston University. Do you know how much it costs for one flipping year of Boston University? 60 grand, what, 80? Yes. One year. She's got two years in there because it was a master's degree. She got her bachelor's and then she's like, I'm going to get a master's degree because I got to get a good degree so I can get a good job with benefits. And then she became a social worker. Dude, it's because everyone has a mentality. You have to go to college. You yeah. have to have to go to college. It's depressing. It, it, and it, was kind, it, it was kind of funny. Actually, I took a psychology class, uh, I think my second or third year mm -hmm. in, in college. And then I changed my degree. And then I came back that next year. To my psychology teacher, I ran into her and I was like, hey, just want to let you know that I'm actually going to change my uh, degree to a psych major. Yeah. And she's like, don't do that. Please do not do that. <laughs> and I was like, why? It's like, you changed my life. This is, yeah. I want to do this. And she's like, honey, please, if you can do me a favor, go over there and change your degree and find something that you love. Yeah. Unless you want to become a teacher or someone that's getting paid minimum wage. <laughs> right? Right? Like, what are you going to do? No, like, I, I can make money, right? It's like, yeah, teaching other people to do yeah. th this. Like, that's it. Yeah. There's nothing else. It's such a scam. I, I don't like sc schools, man. And they teach you some yeah. classes that just don't make any sense. Art appreciation. I'm, <sighs> I, 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 I'm sorry if I'm offending someone that really loves art, but, you know, all those other classes, finite, yeah. this, this, and that. Show us some taxes. Yeah, dude, for real. That should be on. That should no, be no, a course, no, no, man. No, da no. David wants you Hold to on. teach the history of <laughs> of the Tea Party, and yeah. the, <laughs> David needs some some explanation of all this because this just doesn't <laughs> jive with him. I don't. I don't want. I, I I don't want to teach how to do taxes. That's a terrible. Well, not not the. I'm just talking about learning a little bit about taxes. We don't know anything about taxes, and they're they're expecting that they're going to throw us out and then just say, "Okay, here." No, that's this. how they want yeah. us, though. They want you to go, "Hey, you don't need to know how to do this. Just take this little piece of paper down to that office. This is H and R Block, and they'll give you back money." What? Yeah, you worked all year. You need your refund. Oh, okay. So you go down there and like, I got $4,000. $4,000 for what? Oh, well, I went down there and got my taxes too good done. To be true. <laughs> like, do you understand that you just, that means you overpaid by $4,000. You just gave them an interest free loan for $4,000. They're probably going to come find us at some point. You know that, right? Let them come. The IRS people are going to be knocking on the door. You know what's fascinating? So I'm from the Northeast, okay. right? We went up there. We went up there, and um, you can resonate with this because of what you went through with the whole like parking lot thing. That was you, right? Yeah, that was your whole thing. Man. Still dealing with it. Um, <laughs> oh man, really? Yeah, still dealing. With it. I'm just. I I don't. You're you're a better man than I because I would have definitely calmed down the Killdozer route. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that would have been me. That would have been Killdozer 2.0. <laughs> Dave Roman, <laughs> the parking lot situation. <laughs> Are you familiar with the Killdozer? No. He's, what? He's, his he's eyes so glazed his. over no, when I ahead. said Killdozer because he was like, okay. No, I'm like, mm, I don't think he knows. <laughs> no, no, we, yeah, we'll we let you. We'll let you start, start research that one on your own. Anyway, uh, we'll talk after. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> David doesn't want to give up his plans. No, no, <laughs> no. With no grenade. What are you talking about? What? Give us all plans. It's it is the the saddest and also the most inspiring story uh, in in uh, in modern American history. But it, I uh, we go up to <laughs> we go up to um, we go up to to Boston and um, my, my wife surprised me with some tickets to go see the Celtics. I'm a big oh, nice. Celtics fan, right? Nice. And. Uh, and so we were up there, and I, I love museums and history and stuff like that. Now, like warships, those are stupid. But the <laughs> I love fire. For a man backed into the corner, how many times am I going to have to say that this week? <laughs> so we went, we went uh, and visited um, where where the first shots of the American Revolution, like that, where it actually happened. The field, we were in the field, I'm walking around taking pictures of rocks. 
because they had on there at this place mm-hmm. at this date you know this happened it was absolutely fascinating but they have an entire exhibit which is the most absurd thing that this is in boston in massachusetts like the nickname of the state was taxachusetts like that was the thing because you everybody just kind of knew if you go into massachusetts they're going to tax the living crap out of you because they nickel and dime you over every little thing Everything is higher in, ta- in in Massachusetts because of the taxes. So a lot of people just go shopping in New Hampshire or whatever. Anyway, when we go in there and I'm walking through the old state house and there's just all these displays about how the Revolutionary War is, was set off. And the things that they would do to these people just for showing up at their door going, hey, so the king across the ocean said, you need to pay taxes on those paper goods that you just, so we're going to need this money. Mm-hmm. And what they would do to those people just for asking. And they, they did it out in the open and perfectly public and totally everyone was cool with it going, yeah, mm-hmm. screw that guy. Go hang him from a tree. <laughs> and now we're in this world where we've like created something worse than what would have been if it it's, never happened. It, I, we, not only did we, we backtracked to that now that, oh, it's like, oh, okay, well, you know, if we got pay my fair share and you just whip, whip, whip. And then now it's like, you're, you're seen as evil for not like for following the tax code and avoiding as much as you can. You're seen as a, why aren't you paying your fair share? Mm-hmm. They need to pay more. Get the, Mm. And you know where? Okay, so you need to run for mayor of that town. That's what you need to someone do. Someone actually told me that. Hey, someone hey. actually brought that up, and they're like, "We will endorse you." And I was just like, "Dude, I have so I much will, on my plate. I will contribute to your campaign. Honestly, I will too." Now, honestly, God, I have so much on my plate right now. It's just crazy. we will drop it in the Facebook group, and <laughs> so it's like small twenty five dollar donations. We need to make sure this man wins. Yeah, they brought it up. It was actually last year. I went to uh, one of the counts. Okay. Someone brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone brought it up, and he's like, yeah, we will endorse you and all that. And, I was, and he's like, think about it. Get, get back to me the next week, and we'll talk. And it's just with the newborn and shop yeah. and YouTube and all that good stuff it is. So wh- where do we stand right now? What – Give give a little bit of the background because I think we need to at least since you brought it How up. How does everybody not know this story already? I guess he didn't know Killdozer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If it, anybody listening to this doesn't know Killdozer, then you need to look that up. Yeah, I'm still. I, I want to hear that story. So after yeah. this, we'll talk about it. So yeah, uh, I've been leasing. Uh, what was it? Two shops. So my first shop was a one bay garage, mm-hmm. uh, only two parking spots. Then after a couple of years, I moved to an actual uh, shop shop Mm -hmm. because this one was in a business center. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So my dad was always helping me out. He would find the shop for me. And and finally, we got this one shop that I'm actually in right now. It's a two-bay garage, uh, and it has like maybe four parking spots. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've always wanted to own a shop myself, not just rent one out. I want to own one. And finally, the owner, uh, he raised the rent, and I just told my dad, hey, let's just go drive around, and let's see what we can find. Yeah. And we're driving around the uh, uh, Pasadena, and right at the last moment, I was about to say, let's go back home, and let's just, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do it tomorrow. Once we were about to turn, he's like, just go straight. And we just went straight for maybe less than 20 seconds. And right on the left hand side, I see a building right there. Yeah. For sale. 100. Uh, so we walked in, just looked at it. And my dad's like, we need to get this machine shop. Walked in there, talked to the guy. Hey, how much are you looking for? And he's like, uh, 100 grand. And I was just like, uh, would you do 90? Yeah. And he's like, yeah, let's do this. We shook, we shook hands, and I was just like, "Dad, I just bought a shop." Oh, that's awesome! Like, Ninety grand. Yeah. <laughs> and I was, and I was like, "What do I do now?" And he's like, uh, "Let's go get a loan." So I went to the bank. the The only thing they could offer me was a home equity loan. Mm-hmm. So we, my house is already paid off. So we used that, 
and they only offered they could only give me eighty six thousand. So yeah. I went back to the owner and I was like, dude, I only have eighty six thousand. He's like, oh, okay, you're good. So I talked to everyone else and they're like, dude, I think you only bought the building. You didn't buy the land. There's something going on, or, or maybe he might be owing something, or something's going on. Yeah. No, when we went to the title place, place was clean. It was legit. Yeah, it was yeah. legit. But then once we got the location, uh, like I said, I've already moved to two different locations. So mm-hmm. when we got the location in there, it was pretty easy. Did my certificate of occupancy and then did all my uh, inspections and so on. So we move into this. We're getting ready to you know, start doing our certificates yeah. and so on. And uh, they denied their, the CO. So they denied that. And I was like, what's going on? And she was like, because uh, a change of uh, ownership. ownership, yeah. yeah. But the thing is that they didn't treat the machine shop as an automotive shop. So they said there are two different entities. And the machine shop was an office job. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So at that point, that's when they uh, they just had a new ordinance that they put in that year. And that new ordinance was for every 100 square feet of the actual building, you got put one parking spot. Mm-hmm. And that was 2758, something like that. So that was 28 parking spots. Mm. And Holy if you heard, and, and you heard me before, how many spots did I have on my first location? Yeah. Two, and then my second location, three, and now you want me to have twenty eight? Yeah, uh, yeah. And I'm it, all a payment, not, bo- yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a pay- uh, appointment base only, so uh, specialty shop. You know, I'm, I'm yeah. you know, it's a quick turnaround. So that happened. We went, we went to court. Um, you know, lawyers just try to manhandle me you know try to scare me and all that I the city's you, lawyers yeah city's lawyers but uh yeah listening to a lot of tony robbins and all that kind of really yeah. helped me ramp out yourself that. up yeah, yeah. Ramp myself dude i got to the point when we uh we, we we went to i forgot what it's called the first meeting uh where you sit down with them and all that mm-hmm. and i remember driving over there and i was just i was scared and yeah. I just remember watch. I actually turned on Tony Robbins at that moment, and he was talking about, you know, never veer away from what's in front of you. Yeah, he's like, you gotta look it straight forward and go for it. Face he, it head on. Yeah, yeah. face it head on. He's, he there's one that he was talking about. He said he was doing a a drifting class, and every time he would always turn his head when he's going straight to the wall to drift. Mm-hmm. And he said the instructor would actually pull his head forward to just you gotta. Yeah. You, the demons in front of you, you got to yeah. go, for, you got to go through them. So yeah. that, and that's what got me going through that. You know, I just, after hearing that, you know, we went through all the court cases, but now dealing with the city, they just have infinite amount of money. Yeah. And you, you've kicked the hornet's nest now. So they're yeah, kind of. How big is Pasadena? It's pretty huge. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, put it this way. They have the largest uh, volunteer firefighter you know, in the mm-hmm. whole United States. Hmm. So this, it's a pretty big city. Okay. And they have a lot of funds. We, uh, pub- yeah. The public information that I've seen, they have a lot of funds. So someone small like me, in stature too, but dealing with the city of Pasadena, mm-hmm. you know, that's, uh, but what I'm, what I'm trying to do is, you know, as, <laughs> since I was little, I've always been smaller and everyone has always tried to push me. Yeah. But I've, I'd never let that, you know, down and then just walk away. No, if it's a bully or if it's the big city of Pasadena, we're gonna, yeah, keep gonna on push going. forward. Yeah, yeah, keep on pushing forward. And the thing is, so my my dad passed away last year. Oh man, yeah. I'm sorry so to hear that. it was uh, it was a day after Vision, where I, I flew back over there and got to be with him for the last day, uh, and that was one of his main things. He wanted that shop to open. Yeah, and now that's my goal. Right. Just, just for him, and yeah. we 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 have a picture over there, a little uh, kind of mural of him at the shop because mm-hmm. he was always over there mm-hmm. from the day that we bought the shop to the day that we finished painting it. Any contractor that was there, he was there, yeah. making friends, talking to them, doing this, this, and that, and and you know now we're doing it for him. And it was kind of crazy. The last couple of months, he knew something was something was wrong. And he was like, son, we got to get this going. Come on, come on, come on. Let's, yeah. ju- let's just open it up. And I was like, dad, all this litigation, we can't. I'll get fined and so yeah. on. Mm-hmm. 
but yeah, it was just, uh, I knew something was up. He really wanted to open it up. Like he was pretty lenient the whole time, you know, through yeah. the process of, 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 tr you know, fixing it up, you know, doing all the repairs and so on. But the last couple of months he was just like, come on. And, and he was there. Uh, I remember doing the floor. He was on his knees trying yeah. to put some rebar in there and all. I was like, dad, get up, man. Come on. But yeah, it was just, uh, we're gonna keep on fighting. That's 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 all I right. can say. It, it, I'm 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 not gonna give up. But the thing is, at the city, what they're trying to do, they're trying to make sure that I am done with my funds. They're gonna keep on pushing it. Yeah, the, this might be another two three years. Holy cow! Yeah, they're gonna start right. to starve you out. Well, that's awful. Yeah, but right now, and and that's the Who, thing. Who's who's the ultimate? Like, who's the? You're trying to sue them. And override the co co the code enforcer, right? Yeah, basically, like I said, in every other shop that I moved into, I'm not moving into a, an ice cream parlor. Yeah. yeah, you know, yeah, the my location looks like an automotive shop. Yeah, I, I was not moving into uh, you know a place a McDonald's or something like that. We're not making crazy but, uh, changes. Who's making the decision though to to not give you the exemption? The lady that runs this, uh, the the code's uh, office, yeah, right? code's office. So yeah, you're trying guy. to sue them for a judge to override her decision. Yeah, who is she elected? No, she's not elected. Who puts her in in place then? It's the yeah. So you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to. How how often are the mayors getting turned around? In four years? I believe so. If I'm not mistaken. Have you looked into? Have you looked into that side of it and gone, okay, who's going to be running for mayor? I need to, I need to make contact and be like, hey, we need to make this. Uh, I've I've had a some, part of your campaign. Yeah, I've had some people come up to me and talk to me about it. I'm I'm running I'm running for mayor. If you know, if I get elected, I'm going to help you out. But yeah, it's just everyone in that city loves that mayor. But it's really crazy because. The way that he was promoting himself, he's there for he, he was there for the small businesses. Okay, so why not why not go after him? I just I have a lot in front of me right now. I, I, I just don't. know. I feel I, like somebody needs to be doing yeah, this for you, Lucas. No, no, trust me. I I got to the point where I was going to put all my energy towards that. Yeah. But right now, so this is what I've told everyone right now. I am treating that location as a savings account. Yeah. That's all I'm kind of doing because yeah. I'm just kind of putting money there. I'm building equity. Sure. Yeah. yeah. The the building's worth a lot more than what I've paid. Yeah, yeah. So right. that's why I'm not freaking out as much. I have yeah. uh, I have other stuff that's right in front of me and then I'm putting all my energy towards that. Right. Which is going to keep me sane. If I keep on f focusing over here on that building, yeah, you're not. Which gonna, is not going to define me as a person. I, yeah, I don't know. you're gonna you're gonna lose your focus. You're gonna be distracted. And you need to be our freedom fighter, Oz. I, I hate to tell you. <laughs> no, trust me. There, there's a uh, uh, some stuff that I'm uh, really looking into. It. But yeah, it's just a uh, it's a crazy road, man. Uh, my attorneys did call me about a month ago, and I was like, "Hey, so what's next?" And she's yeah. like, uh, "Maybe about ten months from now, we'll get an answer." Holy cow. Yeah. That's crazy. 10 months. Huh. They don't care. It's not their money. Uh, they dude, don't care. It isn't their money. L luckily, my attorneys are wonderful. They're doing this pro bono. So Really? Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, that's so, awesome. So that's been helping out a lot. They're amazing people. But they did call me last year, and they just told me, look, Oz, if you want to, we can stop now. We just don't want you to be hurting so much financially. Yeah. And I was just like, no, I'm doing okay. Yeah. They're like, are you sure? No. Trust me. I'm doing yeah. okay. We'll be all right. Yeah, I'll, we'll be all right. Uh, I've been taking other uh, ventures and all that, and it's been helping out a lot. So, uh, you know, uh, I'm just okay. I'm okay. That's why I tell everyone. You, it's the it's the principle of it at this point. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. And, and like I said, now, I'm, now I just want to do it for my dad. Amen, buddy. That, that's the main thing. I'm pretty, that, I, I'm pretty sure he's looking down right now and he, the day that we open is going to be an emotional day for the whole family sure. and yeah. everyone around us. Is there something our listeners can do to help? Uh, I don't know. You know, 
Uh, I'm not a person that asks for stuff. I don't know. Yeah, (laughs) I'm that person. Boy, Christmas comes up, I'm just give me a pair of socks. I don't care, (laughs) right? And that I I, I, I just I'm not. I don't know. I I just don't ask for stuff. I I, I understand. Yeah, Uh, I I feel like this is my battle. Yeah, and you know I'm I'm ready for it. You know I'm 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 not gonna give up on it. That's awesome, dude. Thank you for being here. Oh, for sure, man. Thanks for thanks for uh, inviting me. Yes, sir. All right.